All right, Thanks, Christine. It. All right, I'm going to share a screen. Um, and again, just to echo, thanks for, for coming here. I know things are always busy. Um, as a quick note, it's 5 p.m. here in Sharjah. My children are all home um, and doors have never proven a, a, a consistent means of keeping them out. So hopefully it will be okay, but you could hear things. If you do, I apologize in advance. Um, so I'm going to, as, as uh, Sam alluded to, I'm going to uh, be presenting today um, a, a part of what I'm going to pull out of the short book um, that I recently published with um, the elements uh, in publishing and book culture. Uh, really broadly, the book explores how diverse spaces of bookselling from bookstores to street booksellers, traveling booksellers, um, and catalogs themselves, how these different spaces work to shape our engagement with books and community. Um, so today I'm going to I'm going to zoom in a little bit more short talk adapted from the section on street bookselling. Uh, this section examines how the street um, and I separated two things traveling booksellers on the road or informal sidewalk tabletop booksellers, how the street engages questions of mobility, access, and exclusion for the booksellers and their customers. Uh, I argue that street booksellers use diverse strategies to inscribe geographies of belonging for the bookseller and their community of consumer readers. Um, following urban geographers, I discuss belonging as a spatial construct that's negotiated through material, discursive, uh, and social means. So for the material landscape, for instance, can communicate what belongs and what doesn't. If you put a planter where a sidewalk bookseller means to be setting up, that's communicating something. Uh, um, belonging can be negotiated rhetorically, um, bookselling memoirs, editorial defenses of sidewalk bookselling, lawsuits, all make discursive space for belonging. Um, and lastly, following spatial theorists like Henri Lefebvre, Michael Deserteau, and Edward Soja, um, belongings also mediated through socio-spatial categories of class, race, gender, uh, among others. Yet despite being embedded and enmeshed in all of these existing power and authority structures, geographies of belonging can be reimagined and reshaped through the lived experience of space. And that's what I'm sort of zooming in on is how these booksellers negotiate the lived experience of space to create their own um, their own. Uh, both consumer communities, bookselling communities, as well as social communities. So the rest of the talk, I'm going to look at sidewalk booksellers in the late 20th, early 21st century New York City um, to explore how they've created and negotiated their own geographies of belonging, from strategies to invade, uh, sorry, evade regulatory enforcement to the cultivation of intellectual exchange, New York City sidewalk booksellers use the contested space of the sidewalk, not only to make a living, but also to create an inclusive space that incorporates the book and bookselling into the dynamics of urban social exchange. Uh, but first, a bit about sidewalks and public space in New York City. Regulating, shouldn't surprise you, yeah, but regulating public space and peddling has a long history in New York City, nearly as old as the city itself. Uh, in 1691, to appease merchants in the public markets who are upset over competition from informal vendors, street selling was prohibited until two hours after the markets opened. From then on, street peddling was always in tension with municipal authorities, storekeepers, and class and race-based constructions of public space. Uh, with the rise of the ideal of rationalized urban space, expressed in the right angles and gridded streets of the commissioner's map of 1811 and the rise of commercial enterprise in the 19th century, the city was reordered for economic gain and the street and sidewalk dedicated to smooth transit and traffic flow. And I just gave you that close up to show the, the red, what the existing streets were, right, before this imaginative projection of what New York would and ultimately did look like with these gridded, regularized streets. Um, we'll come back to that idea in a little bit. Um, but this shift, the shift into making the sidewalk about smooth transit, traffic flow, facilitating all these other sort of commercial uh, uh, flows of the city, um, according to historian Bluestone, Dave, Daniel Bluestone, sorry, discouraged street buying and selling, as well as social uses of the street for political activity, socializing, and amusements. Today, so we'll skip ahead a bunch. Business Improvement Districts, um, BIDs, which became a significant political force in the 1980s, take up the economic and physical regulation of sidewalks, participating in the semi-privatization of urban space. 
BIDs are formed and governed by local property owners, commercial tenants, residents, and elected officials for the purpose of protecting and boosting local business interests. They're publicly authorized, legally sanctioned, but privately administered institutions. Although, as planner Yating Lu notes, the law does not expressly give permission to BIDs to regulate public space in their district, they've leveraged their ostensible beautification and improvement initiatives into a successful lobby for restricting street vendors. From hiring security to installing planters or trees to advocating at city council meetings, BIDs actively shape public sidewalk space. And as these regulatory efforts began to impact Manhattan streets, the number of sidewalk booksellers actually grew, in large part because of their special status among street vendors. According to the general vendors law, all New York City vendors are required to obtain a city license to vend. However, in 1982, the city council amended the law, exempting vendors of newspapers, periodicals, books, pamphlets, and other similar written material. Citing protection as free speech under the First Amendment, the City Council noted that it is consistent with the principles of free speech and freedom of the press to eliminate as many restrictions on the vending of written matter as is consistent with the public health, safety, and welfare. So not required to obtain expensive licenses or to engage with labyrinthine bureaucratic processes, more and more book vendors set up sidewalk tables. By 2006, the advocacy organization Street Vendor Project estimated that more than a quarter of all downtown Manhattan street vendors were so-called First Amendment vendors. However, although First Amendment vendors are afforded special consideration, they're subject to many other regulations, primarily focusing on the space that they occupy. A book vendor stand can be no more than three feet wide and eight feet long. It can't lean against a glass window or be set up within a certain distance of subway entrances, bus stops, driveways, or crosswalks, which is, you can imagine, already just cycling down these spaces that are available. In addition, First Amendment vendors, with the important exception of U.S. military veterans, must also abide by the street-specific uh, restrictions for general vendors. This growing list of restricted streets, and I want to show you, hopefully this works, quick video. We're just going to scroll through the, the streets. You don't need to read it. Just note the, the, the sheer number of streets that are restricted. So this growing list of restricted streets works to corral vendors into ever smaller areas and reduce access to streets with highest pedestrian density, precisely what the vendors need to sustain business. So embedded in these arguments about regulating sidewalk vendors is a neoliberal urban ideal of ordered, unobstructed public space. The increase in book vendors in the 1980s and early 1990s made them particularly visible targets for these arguments. Um, Peter Malkin, the chairman of a prominent uh, Midtown BID, wrote in the 1992 New York Times editorial on pending legislation to remove First Amendment protections that sidewalk booksellers contribute to a sense of disorder and cause sidewalk congestion. Book vendors, he argues, should be moved instead to restricted zones enforced by hired BID security so that they might give our busiest sidewalks, quote, back to pedestrians. There's no acknowledgement of overlapping geographies, right, that these pedestrians are also customers for sidewalk book tables. The conflict then over control of sidewalk space is fought in part in the language used to describe the book, book vendors. In editorials like these, in news articles and public records, Anti-vending arguments use um, terms like encampment, obstruction, occupation, clogged, and virtual blockade, outlining a dominant spatial logic of movement and flow that's impeded by the stacked tables of booksellers. This spatial logic, which underpins neoliberal views of the city as a primarily economic space of global capital flow, means that city sidewalks must be made empty to facilitate this capital. The crime of the book vendor, then, is in his material presence. He sets up a stand and stays, a rock in the flow of pedestrians, redirecting the current of the street into the eddies and stopped pools of his own entrepreneurial space. The rhetoric of street booksellers and their supporters work to emplace street bookselling. 
Variously labeled an institution, a fixture, an open air bookstore, a metropolitan refuge, even a funky haven. The sidewalk here is refigured as a social and cultural space that is made through bookselling. Efforts to rhetorically emplace the sidewalk book table allied the commercial functions of street bookselling while claiming a public cultural right to the city's sidewalks um, and resist these larger dynamics of a neoliberal colonization of space. Claiming space, of course, is more though than a declaration of words. Sidewalk booksellers also employ material practices to emplace themselves. Informal strategies for claiming and managing space sometimes focused on avoiding conflict with municipal authorities. In the West Village in 1992, sociologist Mitchell Dunier described how sidewalk booksellers claimed specific corners. Muhammad and his family sold black authored books and incense on the corner of 8th Street and 6th Avenue. Further down that block, an older white man stopped bestsellers and hardcovers on the weekends. Across the avenue at Greenwich Street, one would find comics and Alice, a Filipina woman who sold best-selling paperbacks. This unofficial system for adjudicating space was orderly um, in Denier's analysis because it, quote, maximized the interests of vendors whose method of allocating space had depended on minimizing contact with the official law. However, the passage of Local Law 45 in 1993 shifted the spatial management system. Stipulating that First Amendment vendors were restricted from the same streets where food and general vendors were already banned, that long list that I, I showed earlier, the law dramatically reduced the vending space available to booksellers in the West Village. As disputes over available space increased, a new job category emerged, the placeholder. Often unhoused men who lived on the street, placeholders would guard a specific location overnight for the vendor. Quote, I need a little space became the focal point of negotiation on the sidewalk and new systems for determining spatial rights emerged. But even then these informal spatial mechanisms sought to avoid direct conflict with law enforcement. But on the other hand, for at least one sidewalk bookseller, the increase in regulatory oversight and ever multiplying subsections of municipal vending ordinances presented its own opportunity for resistance. On July 4th, 2016, police seized Kirk Davidson's books from his 10 folding tables on the sidewalk of Broadway near 73rd Street on the Upper West Side. Joking that the July 4th date of the seizure made, seizure made it an American story, Davidson prepared to go back to court again. No stranger to the legal structures that controlled his sidewalk space, by this time, after 30 years as a sidewalk bookseller, Davidson had reported receiving nearly 200 summonses. Most of these were for occupying excessive sidewalk space with multiple tables. Contributing to his remarkable longevity, 30 years as a street bookseller, 200 summonses, many, many appearances in court, um, was Davidson's familiarity with the municipal regulations for street vendors and book vendors more specifically. In short, he made a business out of challenging his summonses. Most often he cited administrative or enforcement errors to have the charge dismissed. And then following the dismissal of summonses, the army veteran bookseller would then sue the city for unlawful enforcement and seizure. According to his own accounting, these suits were turned over $80,000. Uh, it's a job in itself, Davidson explained, reframing the primary business of the street bookseller as resisting and profiting off of the overreaching regulatory oversight of urban space. In addition, Davidson deftly turned racialized space to his own benefit. Street level policing practices, such as stop and frisk and broken windows policies, which were implemented in the 1980s and 1990s in New York, along with vendor regulation enforcement, disproportionately target black and brown men, creating a threatening nexus of race, space, and policing on the street. Considering most sidewalk vendors are for marginalized groups, Davidson and other minority vendors often face excessive law enforcement. Yet as a result of Davidson's deft understanding of both his rights as a First Amendment vendor and the vagaries of administrative processes, he's turned the heightened surveillance and police action against him to his own benefit and consistently reasserted his right to belonging on the street. So in addition to the diverse ways that sidewalk booksellers deploy spatial or legal strategies to claim a space for books and book selling on the contested sidewalk, they also contribute to the dynamics of urban social exchange by crafting a participatory space of intellectual exchange. 
Though BIDs and regulatory structures attempt to constrain the entrepreneurial efforts of sidewalk booksellers, the street's not only an economic or a legal space, it's also a social space. Uh, this was Jane Jacobs's focus. The point of the social life of city sidewalks is precisely that they are public. They bring together people who do not know each other in an intimate, private, social fashion. One young book buyer in the West Village explained his perception of the street book table through the lens of social exchange. Interviewed by a Mitchell denier on his loyalty to Hakeem Hassan's sidewalk book table of books on Black life, Jerome explained, quote, in the bookstore, they have a lot of arrogance. They have their PhD or whatever their title may be, and they're arrogant in a certain way. But at his table, we could talk about the books. The possibility of one-on-one -on -one conversation in a non-intimidating environment, contrasted with the perceived elitism of the bookstore, situates the sidewalk table as an inclusive space. It's also in Jerome's estimation about the publicness of the street vendor. Quote, you can talk to the vendor, he says because he sits there and he sees what goes on. He sees all that and people talk to him more and relate. Denier adds the, the quote, presence of books on the street tends to prompt discussions about moral and intellectual issues. Jen Fisher, a street bookseller in the East Village has called these conversations quote, an intense chain of gathered knowledge. She compares sidewalk book conversations to the quote, oral tradition of storytelling, the movement of conversation, and how it changes depending on the energy of the listener and the day. Pushing back against models of the sidewalk as an unimpeded transit space, the book table is a place to stop, to converse, to engage in the give and take of social exchange. Certainly these exchanges and discussions can happen in a multitude of book places, the bookstore included. But more formalized spaces often come with, as Jerome's comments allude to, more social conventions that can constrain open access and participation. In New York City, ideals of participatory social contact are also tied to the spatial imaginary of the city. Defenses of sidewalk book vending regularly invoke its fundamental relation to the socio-spatial identity of New York City. Sidewalk booksellers have long been part of the fabric of, the New, of New York City, the New York Times asserts. In an editorial opposing increased regulation of Upper West Side book vendors, sidewalk bookseller Mark Soloff argues, for New Yorkers, the restrictions will mean the loss of a feature of the city that, in however modest a manner, contributes to the atmosphere of intellectual exchange, for which New York is renowned. When Kurt Brokaw, an Upper West Side sidewalk uh, book dealer in vintage paperback and pulp fiction, is asked about his sidewalk book selling in the New York scene, he identifies prominent figures that have stopped by his table, including author Philip Roth, journalist David Halberstam, and orchestra director James Levine, triangulating his sidewalk book table with the literary and cultural life of the city. He notes, quote, enough people walk up here once in a while that we can have some fun out here. The focus on walking, walk up here, recalls De Certeau's spatializing act of walking as a lived experience that undermines disciplined space and creates the city. People as the German Wandersmanner, whose bodies follow the thicks and thins of an urban text they write, in his words. Sidewalk booksellers and their customers claim a right not only to the physical space of the city, but to writing its social and imaginary space as well. So to conclude, um, I've highlighted a few of the strategies through which New York City sidewalk booksellers, I'll get to that, <laughs> negotiate socio-spatial geographies of belonging amid the fundamental street tension between openness and control, access and exclusion. Uh, for sidewalk booksellers, the point is to stay rooted, unmoved by the corralling of regulatory efforts and to reincorporate the book and book selling into a model of the city as an inclusive space of dynamic exchange. But even as local conditions shape specific contexts, street book selling is a global phenomenon. Um, sidewalk booksellers everywhere must erect their tables on and navigate the unstable and shifting boundaries of the sidewalk as regulated and politicized public space. Um, so this is my, my call for others. <laughs> we need, I would love, a focused comparative exploration of the informal markets of street book selling in its global context. Um, in this way, we might expand our understandings of the social and cultural work of bookselling, and more specifically, the diverse ways that sidewalk booksellers, 
as a particular type of street vendor, right? Different, I would argue different than food vendors and other types of vendors. How sidewalk booksellers deploy practices of belonging and facilitate community in the context of formal structures of exclusion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kirsten. That was brilliant. Sorry, I'm still scribbling my notes. Um, <laughs> I'm going to hand over to Eben now. Eben, are you all right to sort of chair questions and comments? Yes, I think I can handle that bit. Thank you. All right. Um, so the next state phase of today is I want to, while we have Kristen here, um, we want a chance to talk a little bit broader about, we'll get this into focus, um, her books uh, and some of the ways what she's just been talking about fits into the rest of the narrative that she's been putting together here. So I thought it'd be nice just to have a bit of a chat with her and then follow on that. We'll open it up for to wider for everyone's questions about what her presentation plus whatever we've raised up in this little chat that happens next. All right. You happy with that, Kristen? Sounds good. I don't know. That's it. It's the hot seat, yeah. <laughs> there we go. Um, well, just to start off, but one of the reasons I've one of the first things I really liked about your book was this idea of these the bookstore itself, not the necessarily the street one, but the you have this breakup of the in, intimate versus the monumental bookstore. Yeah. And like, would you mind just introducing that concept again? For a moment? Yeah, so that was um so I wanted to play around with, and again, and I'm coming from to a, a, a literature background, right? That's my that's my my area where where I, I teach and work in. Um, and this book does not necessarily engage specifically with literature in any in any way, except for I'm interested in language <laughs> in general, right? Um, and and I got interested in how the sort of repeated um, patterns of describing bookstores with. Um, language like nooks and crannies, cozy. I mean, these words appear constantly in lots of different, um, you know, advertising for bookstores, bookseller reminiscing. I mean, um, even uh, scholarly studies of bookstores. And so I got interested in, in, in what's happening with that sort of, of language. And then at the same time, previous research I had done in 19th century bookstores were focused on sort of the development of um, bookstores as dedicated retail spaces. Um, that uh, were tied with the rise of the department store. And so this really idea of a bookstore as this, this monumental space that's part of a growing middle class. And so it, it had to, it adhered to um, these sorts of, of large open spaces, of, of refinement, of sort of social surveillance. So I saw these two as, as two sort of different typologies. Mm -hmm. um, both rhetorically and what's happening in things that you know that we're reading, as well as spatially. Um, and so what and I, that section when I, I'm talking about these two different topologies of the intimate and the monumental are just it's trying to play around with how these how we're describing bookstores is revealing uh, on one hand and shaping too how we're associating ourselves with reading, with books, with what bookstores are. And obviously they're always overlapping and everything's messy. Um, but I do think that it's a there, there's some really interesting patterns um, that we're always that we come back to and have uh, historically um, in how we're thinking about the, the cultural role of, of bookstores. And they get tied to these ideas of the intimate and the cozy and the the separate. Mm -hmm as well as the, the highly engaged with sort of commercial and um, um, uh, public culture. Yeah. yeah, as you know, my the stuff I do on fictional bookstores fits really interestingly with the, the sort of typologies you've got. And you see, I'd imagine you see a lot more of this sort of this, this intimate space of exploration and fiction, yes? Yeah? yeah, definitely. It's, uh, is a, is a safety to that space. You described, what is it? Um, time itself, pause, I love this, a hidden space that hides from the ubiquitous monitoring of modernity. Um, the ability to exi exist alone within oneself. It was it happening in those intimate bookstores. Yeah. We talk about escape all the time. I'm sure we're all thinking about it, yeah? yeah. Various, those of us that do or don't have spring breaks, right? And then Evan, you said before everyone arrived here, oh yes, I don't have time to visit bookstores. <laughs> I mean, I know I know we're a self-selected crowd here, yeah? <laughs> well, 
but uh, you know, we're preaching to the choir, but right, but it, it becomes a sort of escape from demands, right? From demands of time, which is just fascinating to me, right? Um, and then in the book, I'm interested in how the spaces themselves, how they're designed, how they're structured, either intentionally or because of you know rent and whatever else, but how those are also shaping um our experience of, of that space or of that escape or or aloneness. Yeah. One that always interests me about that shaping is um particularly for the intimate stores, the smaller ones, a bookseller tends to rent a space or buy a space. So they're stuck with that shape, that location, and then they have to design it somehow. They have to work with what they've been given. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know whether. So again, yeah, I mean, and I can't, you know, we can't always have, we can't have access into all of the, right, all of the different decisions that are made. I'd say that whether, whether a space is designed um, intentionally, or whether it's designed purely because of the constrictions of rent space, everything else, it's still working, right? It's still shaping. It's still, it's still doing something. And we ascribe our own meanings in lots of different ways. I think, I don't know whether um, Matthew might now be actually in the woods with his Easter eggs, but I want, I think it was him that at, at an earlier point, maybe a month or two ago, I don't know, last time uh, we were together, I think it was him had mentioned, um, you know, looking into or starting research into book selling manuals. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he could, he's not here. So if it wasn't him, he won't know. We'll, we'll describe. But um, I, and that's fascinating to me because I think, and that's where then you get into like, okay, regardless of what the exigencies are for, you know, like I said, square footage, how many books, your stock, all that stuff. There are all of these manuals and historically have been, I've looked at older ones, but I'm fascinated by the 20th and 21st century ones that are saying like, you know, even with these constrictions, here's what you should do. And I think that would be a fascinating like next step into thinking about um, because then who's, so who's writing these manuals, what is their interest in these spaces and how they're, how they're structuring. Um, yeah. so yeah, and I, I know that booksellers like yourself and, and others would have a lot to say about mm -hmm. how and why they've designed things the way that they've designed it. Yeah. Um, but I do think overall, my, one of the, the, the points and why I'd love to hear more about mm -hmm. all of that is that I do think that, that spaces give us a really unique entry point into understanding what we know as the cultural work of bookstores, for instance, right? We know bookstores are cultural spaces, like, like any space, um, but how they work. We can do that from an economic perspective. We can do that from a literary perspective. Um, but I do think that that is the sort of space and thinking about design of space gives us a unique way to sort of cross these different these different yeah. disciplines and ways of understanding how it's how how that cultural work is happening. Because you talk in the book, and again, also in your presentation, about these spaces as, in a way, they're homes in a way, aren't they? They're a, you, a momentary home, you describe them as in your book. Um, but for an immigrant coming into the country, they finding a space, or um, a minority culture coming into the space, or uh, a woman coming into a feminist bookstore, this is, there's a home to it. But at the same time, it's a community, isn't it? It's a home as community, or community as home. Yeah, I mean, home is political. Um, you know, it, 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 it and, and, and because it's political, it is about community, right? It is about um, um, networks and connections. Um, and, uh, you know, I think I quote Bell Hooks there, right? When she talks about the, just the, the political like, ness, <laughs> lack of a better word, of home um, and what that means to communities, um, right? So we can talk about home as sort of a, an, an uh, individual feeling um, that can exist within the individual, but I do think, yeah, that 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 bookstores, and I would argue too, just in some of the, the different um, the short examples I gave in the talk, that even street book selling and, you know, lack of like the sort of the physical enclosedness still provides that sort of politicized sense of home as community. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's also a bit about, well, it comes clearly in what you were just, your, your presentation about resistance, isn't it? It's home as a setting up a, my space. This is my this is my place. This is our place. It's the community home. So there's a every bookstore is a act of resistance in a, in a way. Yeah, right. A, a claiming of space, and and you know during uh, during COVID, during I mean in all of the the, the ebbs and flows of of independent book selling, um, that's often right. That's that's the most common rhetorical turn. To make right is that these these places are necessary as whether home is being used, but it's that same sort of language as 
um, community centers, as um, parts of the neighborhood, as spaces for people who don't have spaces themselves. I know you talk about third spaces in your work. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, that, that 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 is right. That's that's the most common sort of rhetor, and I think most powerful rhetorical move to make um, around the the cultural work of bookstores. Yeah. Uh, it's, I find that whole that bit absolutely fascinating. And you, you're you know Dory Massey. You, you talk about Dory Massey, and do you know her, the concept of the chance of space? No. She has this idea that you can create a space that creates potential for things to happen. Yeah. And that's like that. again with the design of these bookstores, the design of the shelving and whatnot is creating potential interactions, potential things that could happen within those spaces. Yeah, that's a nice idea. That sort of potentiality, right? That that's yeah. like an imagined projection, right, of what yeah. can of what could happen. I like that. Yeah. Um, and the other thing, another thing you talked about is the, the organization of the stuff. Not necessarily what books are there, but the uh, design of what sections are called within the bookstore. Um, as a, it's, it becomes a political act, it's an aesthetic act. Um, yeah, I talk about that both in relation to um, subject categories in bookstores, both historically and, and contemporarily, right? They're, they're not stable. Booksellers can determine whatever, right? However they want to categorize their books. Are or booksellers aren't stable or? The categories, okay. sorry, subject categories, oh. right, are, are, are never stable. Um, and um, I talk about it in terms of, of bookstores as well as in, in catalogs too, in that, that last chapter. Um, and how the page is also, and, and how proximity and, and indexes and table of contents are also sort of working to direct or to guide readers in terms of making connections or, you know, drawing together intellectual connections. Um, in For the bookstores, the, the physical bookstores, um, I use Kristen Hogan's idea of a feminist bookshelf, right? Mm -hmm. um, and how putting together certain book titles or whether it's where they're placed in what category or whether how the categories themselves are working together or then the names of the categories all of those are creating intellectual and associational relationships between ideas um and and her her idea of a feminist bookshelf is that right that develops um a critical vocabulary for people um that is uh that is social socially organized right that is that is interested in um in in a, movement oriented bookstores that she's talking about. You talk another in another chapter about itinerant booksellers. We got these two stories in particular, Annie Nels and Catherine Johnson. Yes. Yeah. Catherine Magnolia Johnson. Yes. So um that's this is in the same, I mean these are sort of put them together because it's street. <laughs> <laughs> but like that's on the road and but but again at the the dynamics I was talking about with sidewalks and a sort of this tension between openness that we like to imagine right the openness of the road the openness of the sidewalk right that, that that's not that's not in reality how any of these places work and so I was interested in um, uh, these two itinerant booksellers for again how they're negotiating this tension um, between openness and and the sort of exclusion how they create sort of their own space for book selling on the road. And in the, in the case of the, the itinerant booksellers, more specifically about identity formation, about they how they use traveling book selling as a way to sort of craft um, identities for themselves and their communities. For Annie Nellis, who's a weirdly fascinating character, um, it, it's likely that most of her wild memoir has been well exaggerated. <laughs> <laughs> but there was one scholar who was looking into this and who did pinpoint like her book selling locations that like that was like the, the true, which is interesting in itself, that the true kernel of her story is when she became a traveling bookseller after supposedly right her husband or she left her husband, her husband left her. Um, and this was the only way that she could make ends meet. Um, and that is being the true kernel of this memoir, you know, and she identifies herself in the title page as an, a, a book agent, right, that that just in itself without looking into the memoir at all. Um, it, that her, as a traveling bookseller, it's giving her this identity as an author, right? Or as someone who has something to say, can write these experiences. Um, and then when you read her memoir, um, which I don't know that I recommend, but you can certainly skim through it. Uh, it is wild and it's, it's really interesting. Um, but she, she, she's very interested in gender dynamics. Like I said, she frames her book selling as, um, her escape from, um, 
from sort of patriarchal structures of marriage um, uh, and of, of being trapped in a home that she can't go out and work, of, of trying to get out of reputational um, damage that she's taken. Um, and then, you know, and how when she's traveling around, there's just some interesting scenes of the way that she finds freedom. Um, and I use that with, you know, obviously caveats, it's not idealized in any way, but the way that she sort of asserts herself and finds freedom um, on the road through book selling specifically, right? The book is is yeah. is sort of giving her access um, to these people. There's that scene of like, so she, she gets on this, uh, she's sitting on the side of a road. Yeah, like literally just sitting on the side of the road. And that was one of the scenes that an engraver decided to, to illustrate for her book. So there's this one full page scene of her just, you know, relaxing on the side of the road, very 19th century sentimental, like, mm -hmm relaxing yeah um and and then the and she's trying it's too long of a walk to get from one place to the other she's waiting for some cart to come by in rural indiana or illinois uh, my husband would kill me he's from illinois it must have been illinois uh and 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 this cart comes by and she jumps in with a farmer and he says yeah yeah sure i'll give you a ride to this other place and she has her basket of books and he says what's in there thinking that she's carrying as she says food or something like that and she opens it up and says, it's books. And he says, how can you be selling books out here? No one's going to buy books. And she's like, oh, but you should see this book. Um, and she's selling, a, I think at this time, she's selling a, a memoir from the Civil War. And so she narrates the scene of him picking up this book, of getting so engrossed in this book that he gives her the reins to guide the horses down the road. Um, and she says in, in the way that she's narrating the scene, she says, oh, I could have driven all the way to Chicago. He wouldn't have known. And I just read that scene as a really fascinating, uh, uh, to use your potentiality, right? The sort of fascinating scene of, of freedom and the road that is ascribed only to the book. The fact that, that there was this scene of sort of immersive reading that this, this farmer got into. Um, and and that, that she decides to, to, to narrate this scene as, as something I think is, is significant in the way that traveling book selling, what that's doing for her. Um, for Catherine Magnolia Johnson, um, that section where I'm talking, uh, that's more invested in race. Um, she's an African-American uh, traveling bookseller in um, 20th century, 20, I'm trying, I'm trying to remember all of these now, 1920s and 30s, I want to say. Um, uh, and uh, and she's selling books that are specifically targeting um, black readers uh, about black experience and history in the U.S. Um, and she says that this is the only way for these books to reach these readers. And so, uh, you know, as she travels around, she's sort of creating this network um, of readership um, that is advocating for um, for a recovered or an alternative recovered history. Um, for Black Americans. So, and I think, you know, in relation to the sidewalk booksellers too, I think that's at least from, especially from um, from her memoir as well, or, or her experiences, that looking to these more informal spaces, um, it's always important when we're looking, we're thinking about race and how we narrate history. We need to look at informal spaces that aren't sort of controlled by dominant narratives. Um, and, and for her looking at itinerant bookselling as a Black woman, uh, is really important for understanding how these networks um, for Black readers were created. She went from church to church in, in towns where, you know, Parson Weems, traveling bookseller 100 years before was going because they were cotton towns, right? So he has a different market, right? So we have like an alternative history 100, 200 years later, um, where now she's creating a new network on top of that um, for Black readers. But these informal spaces are where we're seeing how this work is happening, just like I'd say with, with sidewalk book selling, which I think, I, you know, we, as we talk, we talk about bookstores, um, we're really interested in formal networks of book selling. Um, but I think if we think about book selling as more informal networks, too, I think there's some really fascinating things to find there. Yeah, oh, the informal networks are really, really are, you could just travel forever through those, I think. But I find that that, that whole thing really interests me because in my own work, looking at fiction about bookstores, this is the, one of the most common narrative is a woman finding her own agency, her own control over the world by often starting as an itinerant bookseller and then opening up a bookshop. Yeah. So it is, yeah, certainly resonates with people. 
I think so. And I, yeah, and I, I'd be interested to, you know, think more too about comparably, is it something about book selling that's allowing this? Is this just, is it an entrepreneurial, like what, what, and I think there, I mean, for street book selling, especially there is, there's an, I mean, we talk about New York, right? There's an easy entrepreneurial way in because you don't need the, the licenses that you would need. You know what I mean? Like, the, like we can get into like the, the sort of nitty gritty of that stuff, but right. It, there's something about book selling that allows for that sort of entrepreneurial entre entry is really interesting. I'm working now on a, um, sort of imaginative visualization using, I, I do mapping and GIS stuff, of um, um, Bridget and Catherine Rush's bookstore in 1860, New York City, on the northern edge of development. If you were looking at that map, right, of sort of on the northern edge of development in 1860, um, and using fire insurance maps and other records, tax records, to try to recreate, um, yeah, recreate's probably not, but to reconstruct, because you can't really recreate it, but to reconstruct um, her bookstore and the street landscape just as a sort of an exploratory thing to 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 think about you know what it would mean to get a larger context of um whether it be female booksellers in her case especially um operating in this sort of developing entrepreneurial space in New York City and what she would be around surrounded by and the other businesses and the buildings and the streets um so that's been a sort of recent experimental thing um that gets at some of these same dynamics right with an urban planner who is very good at, at doing um, like CAD and architecture <laughs> creations. It's a team effort for sure. <laughs> okay, I've got, I could keep asking you questions for hours, I think. I, I wanted to ask you particularly about the catalog, really an interesting chapter on the book catalog as a book space, which I think uh, I highly recommend that people have a, have a look over that. But there's a bunch of questions coming up in the chat. Um, so clearly people have things that they would like to ask about. Um, starting with Anna. Anna, are you still here? Did you want to read this yourself? Oh, sure. I'm here. Yes, I could read this. It's um, really more of a comment than a question, which is very annoying. Uh, I was Not just wondering <laughs> if you had been thinking at all about something that I'm thinking about, which is the online bookstore and maybe how you're, you're thinking about these spaces um, might relate in some ways to the online bookstore. And I've downloaded your element and I haven't read it yet. So maybe it's already in there, but I'd love to hear about it. It's not, and you're absolutely right. Like again, size and right worlds and paths we could take. I didn't talk about online um, online book selling, um, but I'm very interested in it. I'm very interested in just sort of digital environments as well. Um, and the only really, to, to, to your comment, the only thing I was really playing around with for possible inclusion in the book, and then ultimately there wasn't enough space was, also looking at how, at, at how um, what was it in? It's in the, the bookshop.org, right? That sort of net, the digital networked um, things. How many of these stores were posting images of the store itself on, on their pages, right? And so what's the interaction of sort of photograph of the store um, and what, what did they vote photograph, right? Some of the stores are just photographing like a, a isolated um, um, cabinet or a uh, um, bookshelf of books. You can't tell like, is it theirs? Is it not theirs? But most, like again, in my not scientific survey, um, most were of the interior of the book space, sort of wide panning so that you get a sense of the whole space of the bookstore. Um, and why, why is that needed online, right? You're not going to the book, like you're saying here, right? It's, it's private. You're in the home. Um, you're on your you're not going to this bookstore. You don't need to see their space to get the book you want. Ostensibly, you're probably there because you know what book you want, right? It's a different type of searching. Um, so why why the pictures, right? What is it again about our tie to that? So yeah, I think I yeah I'd love to to re read and and hear more too about your thoughts because I think there's a lot to say there. Yeah, and and that actually is really interesting because there's also this reverse movement. In that case, right, it's like from the physical bookstore to the online bookstore. And then you have in the case of like Amazon, you have the online bookstore. And then John Thompson especially has written about the movement from online bookstore into the Amazon physical bookstore space, yes. which is sort of the reverse translation of the physical to online space. But yeah, super interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Another thing on that point. It used to be when people when bookstores were setting up their own websites, having a picture of the store itself built trust. Oh, this is a real place. It isn't just some guy. Yeah. But why does that matter, right? If some guy has your book, you know, I like, think that's what's fascinating, yeah. right? It does. You're right. It yeah. it, it 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 gives um the sort of ethical like you know an, an appeal, but like why we need that ethical appeal, I think, is really interesting, right? Because we we yeah we're so tied to this this physical space. Lenora. You want to jump in? You were the next question. 
Hi, yes, no, I was just uh, putting my questions in the chat. I have a few. <laughs> so um, I wanted to know if in, in your research, if you found that those street booksellers were primarily selling secondhand books or did they sell newly released books and how are they sourcing those books? So there's lots of varieties, in, and I can start with how they're sourcing, which will give a hint to the rest of it too. There's lots of varieties in how books are sourced. And again, I, I can I, I only feel confident talking about like the, the sort of very specific localized context of New York and you know the 80s and 90s that I was talking about because I'm sure it's it's different in lots of I know it's different in lots of places. I was just reading an article about a Johannesburg, South Africa um, street bookseller who sources his books from a bookstore, a physical bookstore, um, and they have this sort of like really interesting relationship uh, with how they're doing it. But for the booksellers that I was just talking about, um, they source their inventory in a variety of ways. So some of it is scavenging. Um, some of it is secondhand booksellers, right? Um, some of it's in trading. Uh, so there's lots of different ways that they're 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 sourcing. And if I had longer and more time to go into it, there's a really interesting thing to think about too with scavenging and how you're resupplying the reading material from the neighborhood back to that neighborhood and other passerbys through. So you're sort of reading their tables as reading that neighborhood itself um, when we're talking about scavenging. Um, um, but otherwise, yes, secondhand books that they get from a variety of ways. Um, uh, uh, you know, publisher, off print stuff that, that just sort of gets like circulated outward um, uh, and then sort of relationships that they have within themselves. Um, so, uh, oh, I can, I can address your next question too, if that's, if that's there too. Yeah, that'd be great because yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering about the, if the barriers to entry for doing a, a bricks and mortar store, which are great, is, is that contributing to uh, uh, marginalized people being straight booksellers? Yes, absolutely. Um, I don't get into, I didn't talk about it today, but in that the same chapter, the section that I was talking from, um, there's a, a discussion um, uh, from scholars that have done research on street literature in Harlem, a sort of unique um, black focused uh, genre that emerged in the 90s um, and was sold almost entirely by street booksellers, right? And that was it. So that's another relationship that was directly from authors to street booksellers um, because of a dearth of of brick and mortar bookstores uh, in Harlem uh, at the time and continuing today. Um, and yeah, through a variety of, of sort of racist policies that prevent loans um, to all right, a lack of capital in, especially when we're talking about rental and property prices. Again, we think that new liberal space of New York that's just only about property prices. There's no, there's no entry point. There's one uh, for, for a brick and mortar store. Um, there's one story of, of one of these Harlem street literature um, booksellers who did end up um, sort of using his success in street literature because he was sort of there from the beginning to open a brick and mortar store. Um, so yeah, that's an interesting note, but that's a, that's a, that's a, um, an exception. Um, you know and so that just, was? do you remember which store or the name of the, that person? I don't, but if you put your email, give me your email and I can, I can certainly, I can at least direct you to the article, um, the, the scholar that, that works on that too. That'd be great. I'll just put it in the chat. Sure. Thank you. I'll do that. Right. Will Smith. Really? There you go. Oh yeah. Hi. Yes. No, I was, I was just, uh, kind of commenting because I'm really fascinated by those book selling manuals um, twofold by being a researcher and a bookseller so they speak to me on what you can maybe practically learn alongside the theory although uh, I was I was really just mentioning this um, 50s one by Langdon Davies because it, it raises those I think the concerns and it's been kind of talked about in the chat really about the idea that your bookshop window could be too interesting so you wouldn't get customers kind of coming into your shop and that might be because of their their kind of concerns about how intimidating the enclosed space might be but there's also that additional thing of I guess if you're on the street already um, the kind of social commitment to exchange has already been undergone whereas if if they are waylaid by your bookshop window and not because of any desire of of being too intimidated but literally they're kind of their desire for browsing has been sated by your window then you've already kind of you failed in some sense if they're not willing to then make that extra point of coming in and buying a book so um there's the kind of wondering about uh whether i suppose the advantages like you've said of 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 street traders for actually making more commercial transaction because 
their patrons are already right in front of them you know for us we can't kind of pop outside the window and come and confront someone who's browsing to try and begin a conversation not least because they'd be incredibly uncomfortable about that and you know so would I but <laughs> you'd you wonder about the um I suppose the barriers real and 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 kind of strategic in conventional bookshops compared to the ongoing success of of um trading yeah from street level so I, I don't know whether something there's some question there about really the kind of social pressures which are eased in general that kind of add accessibility to to buying from street traders yeah I think there I just think there's a and there's a lot of dynamic like you're saying there's a lot of 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 sort of social dynamics too that are are negotiating how one engages with street booksellers um, or whether one engages with street booksellers um, whether you talk, whether you just sort of browse, whether you touch and pick up um, all those things. But like you're saying, you can do you can do that or not do that without changing much of anything else <laughs> on your way. Um, whereas, as you're saying, in a, in a bookstore, right, and, and that, that you have to enter through that door. There's I've read I was I used a couple of manuals that just had some interesting things about like, you know, how to set up that impulse buy table. Right. That which 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 just is fascinating to me, just the, in the wording. Like, I love this. Like, it's an impulse buy, but it's so planned because you've just now said this is now an impulse buy table. Right. And like, 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 it's just this, this really this, this weird thing that, that yeah, that that's always trying to prep that. And again, the next paragraph in the manual is like, but some buyers won't do this and they'll or they'll only buy from the impulse table and they'll never go into your store and that doesn't help you either right so it's just everything is contingent um and really unstable um but it's it's so important too yeah <laughs> thank you i'll look so sam you said that langdon davies i'll look into that too the yeah. too interesting that's yeah too interesting i love that <laughs> um, lenora is asking about katherine johnson again did she sell books or loan them, give away? She sold. It was selling books. She didn't yeah. loan books. Um, she I'm, sold I'm doing... to individuals and institutions. Okay, that's great. Because I'm doing my own um, different research on uh, bookstores in America. And if that's true, she's the very first bookmobile that sold books. But that credit has usually been given to Bertha Mahoney, who opened up the first children's bookstore in Boston called Boys and Girls, Bookshop for Boys and Girls. So that would be... Um, uh, it's very interesting to follow up on for me. Yeah, again, I can, in my other email, I'll pass on the, again, you can find this stuff in the book too, but I can pass on the um, um, research on, and there's not, there's not enough, yeah, um, but research, uh, there's some really good research, just not enough on um, Johnson. Uh, and yeah, you're right, bookmobiles are most often ascribed to libraries, right, and um, and as, as sort of a mobile library, mobile library institutions, um, and so yeah, it was, it, but yeah, she she had it. It was in the back of her Ford coupe. Um, she had a six foot, you know, shelf of books um, that she drove around with in this Ford coupe. And and um, there's an article um, uh, that was published. Um, I'm not going to remember where, um, but it was written by the head of the MWACP at the time. Um, was talking about you know riding around in her little Ford coupe and and they did the interview while they were riding in her car. So there's some really interesting things about car culture and and mobility too there. I should point out that sometime next year we're hoping to have another Cambridge element on mobile bookstores. So it's oh, to look forward to. <laughs> you can never get enough. No, you can't. <laughs> Not if I'm around. Andrew Thacker. Hi there. Um, I really enjoyed the talk, and I was interested when you were talking about the, um, you know, the, the, the framing through geography, but also the GIS stuff that you referred to the end. And I wondered whether you'd mapped across a map of uh, New York City where they occurred, the sidewalk sellers, and whether any patterns emerged. And I was thinking about patterns such as whether there were more, uh, where there were physical bookstores or whether there was no kind of corollary. Uh, and then whether, you know, whether there was a mapping on to particular socioeconomic dynamics or demographics, i.e. particular com communities, as you just said with Harlem, had more of them because they didn't have the physical store. So, you know, just any any kind of um, patterns emerged if you did that kind of uh, mapping of them. I would need a lovely, well-funded fellowship 
<laughs> so, because part of it is the data yeah like we yeah, don't yeah. because they don't need licenses um they're not track well new york is is not great at tracking this stuff anyway but they're, they're not um they're not tra they're not tracked in the same way so i would and i would love this if there was a fellowship i would wander these streets right and and you know we could we could create a map that way um no what i what would be interested though to map and i haven't been able to find it though i know that new york does have the mapping data um, it is, is just to look at where everyone is restricted and to get a sense of actually what available spaces there are, because then you can certainly start thinking about, okay, where, where are, this would be all vendors though. There's no way to really just make it book vendors, but where are all vendors being pushed to? And, and, and of course there will be socioeconomic implications there, um, um, what, where they're being pushed away from, um, most often, um, the, uh, the, and and the other part too that I, I haven't looked into that I do think would be more interesting too is the relationship between booksellers, um, sorry, brick and mortar booksellers and sidewalk booksellers. Um, I do know that the Upper West Side, um, Kirk Davidson, that he wasn't. This was also during the time of the rise of the big box store. Yeah, of, of, that he wasn't far from from a sort of larger commercial store, um, and there wasn't in any of this, the work that I read, there wasn't a sort of tension there. But I think, and I've read, again, I, like I said, I haven't looked into this in detail, and in sort of cursory certain things that have come up as I've done other research, right? There's there's language that's both about, this is a, this is, just does interfere with my business as a brick and mortar bookstore owner, and this doesn't interfere with my business, right? And, and I think that goes back and forth, and that'd be a more interesting dynamic, I think, to look into. My mapping is on um, 19th century um, bookstores, um, and what we know about bookstores leads us into two distinct areas of the city. But once we map other location data, like directories and tax records, we get a much bigger picture of where booksellers, retail booksellers were operating. So that's where that's where my the actual GIS mapping I do. But if we know of any fellowships, I will happily walk New York streets and create a survey. <laughs> Listen, I, I'm doing a, the other half of that research already. Um, uh, in addition to working on a book on the history of the American bookstore in America, I'm, I'm putting together an incredible database looking at all those directories and um, the database, and these are just bricks and mortar stores, but the database would eventually allow you to completely map the bookstores over time um, in any city. And well, we'll so, have to talk more because, yeah, I mean, I have all that data. That was this is my dissertation many years ago. Um, so yeah. I have tons of Excel spreadsheets and data. And yeah, yeah, we should let's talk more. Yes, absolutely. You have my email. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. This is great. Um, Eleanor, you had a couple of comments you wanted to raise about Windows. Yes. Yeah, I think historically I was very struck by, um, I work on an 18th century bookseller and um, the same kind of really stunning windows. So when Will mentioned that comment about them being too interesting, um, it, it just made me um, think, and you brought this up later, Will, of being more intimidating than interesting. Uh, that's sort of what I thought. And I also think that um, they also assume the parallels that you were making, Kristen, with the, the comments that you found about the street sellers being more um, accessible and inviting because they were right there compared to the elitist people and the, you know, that, that phrase stuck in the PhD that characterized the bookstore. And I thought that was a funny, um, way to characterize bookstores too. And that kind of environment, because often today, some of the workers, you know, they are people that not all, but most that love books, but they're working on very low wages often. And, they, you know, so, um, but anyway, it made me think of Dussorteau's work on walking in the city. And the windows have a, a sort of kinship with elevation from street view, um, although it's in reverse because the people, even though the elevate, uh, the windows are at eye level, there is something about an um, metaphorical elevation where the others have that social exchange just encountering the street sellers. And when you were just talking about where I would be very interested in the mapping too, oh, about maybe nine months ago, a sidewalk seller has popped up in DC. And it's interesting because he's 
within a couple of blocks of booksellers in like the DuPont Circle area, which is not a marginalized neighbor, you know, neighborhood at all. Um, and so it, it, it would just be interesting to see if there are patterns that we don't think of and what kind of work their stock, how it is supplementing the bookstores when they are in close proximity. But thank you. It was a fascinating talk. I've also downloaded your book, but I haven't gotten to it. And I've been telling my students about it because we've been doing a publishing class, but they're talking a lot about the spaces of book selling. And I said, I have the book for you. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I, I don't know anything about DC's rules um, too, because it, right. And, and uh, yeah, oh, that's interesting. Thank you. Yeah. All right. And coming down to Sam and her vending machines. It was it was just a random thought in the way that things do thinking, well, hang on a second, perhaps that is a link. Be because honestly, so many different news outlets are reporting on this social media. If you read this, just hundreds of comments on every post with people like Will um, and Matt worried about, you know, when the book falls down inside the vending machine, is it going to, you know, <laughs> break or, um, you know, but there is a real fascination in popular, re you know, for some reason, the machine has captured it, just like the penguin cubator, I can't say it did back in the 1930s. Is that, do you think, Kristen, because it is a kind of, it's there on the street, you, you know, you, it's even one stage further removed, you don't have to interact with a human being to get right. it. I don't know, could just right. be a very bad random Friday thought. We're talking about having spaces for sociality and that's not acknowledging that sometimes we don't want any sociality at all. But there's a still a kind of yeah. window. There is still, the window is there because of course it's a machine, I don't know. Yeah, my brain but you're is- walking, You're walking by it. I do think too that that interacts with a long history of train reading, right? And of, yeah. of, of selling paperbacks on trains and, and sort of, again, reading and mobility too. Um, but yeah, but I do think that just that seeing something in a, in a we think two of our associations with vending machines, right? They're satisfying immediate need. Maybe you didn't think you needed it until you walked by that Coke machine. And then you're like, oh, I definitely need, you know, and like the, it's, it's sort of tapping into, right. That, that, the, the passing by um, and thinking of things. I, I saw that too. Like I've seen, I've seen those reports. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> but yeah. Like what happens if now we expand the, the sort of the, the boundaries of book selling into vending machines, right? Like, I mean, and I know there's lots to say about the on the on demand printing and that sort of vending, but but this kind of like ready yeah. like retail vending um, is is yeah is is really interesting too. Yeah, yeah. If I that could yeah that could work really interestingly, I think in in the context of street book selling, um, as the that like I'm going to come back again to that idea of the 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 chance of space that you were saying yeah. before Evan at the very beginning. And yeah. Corinne has already sent me a, a, a sort of German version of, of, a, of a book vending machine. But if anyone else on here knows of any other places where there are book vending machines, please let me, please let me know. Cause it's yeah. Becoming a bit of a. Yeah. Uh, Eleanor says, right. That libraries have vending machines too. Right. I mean, this, I, I think this of media too, right. Um, you know, what was red box, right. With the films that, yeah. that, you know, you rent films that way. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a vending culture. Well, Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. Right. I think we're running out of questions. Did anyone else want to raise anything that's not in the chat? No, I, I was just, yeah, go on, Eleanor. Sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm thinking of Samantha's too, because I found that fascinating, the return. And that's how I found the libraries, because I was looking for these, because I think originally, it came from the idea of, uh, and I might be totally wrong about this, um, but Horn and Hard Arts and the kind of cafeteria vending machines. So when you said they've just come up and you showed the picture, I was actually looking for images I've used from, you know, a century or more ago. And that's when I found the libraries. And uh, they did tie it, as Corinna said, to um, the, uh, you know, video vending machines. So anyway, it was just an elaboration on that. <laughs> Thanks, Elena. Going to the end, it looks like. 
right. Sam, did you have any final announcements you want to be making? A announcements, uh, apart from <laughs> my <laughs> random thoughts on vending machines. Um, we have got Matt back. I don't know if Matt is able to talk or if he literally is in a wood with a load of Easter eggs and small people. <laughs> there you go, Matt. Do you want to say anything about the conference, Matt, while you're here to everybody? I'm like, I'm like literally between a whole bunch of places right now. It hasn't stopped. I'm not quite in the woods, though. Um, I'm going to be in touch very shortly with everyone. I know several people here have submitted uh, proposals, and I will be in touch early next week uh, with more particulars. Uh, but it's all coming together. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything. No, I mean, I'll probably include it in the email. So, <laughs> But, uh, you know, stay tuned. Uh, and uh, Kristen, thank you so much. I, I will play. When it's up on the website, I'll have another list and I'll probably write to you with some questions, but uh, sorry, it's just the state of things today. Sure. Uh, and if I anyone understand. has any additional questions about the, oh, sorry. Yeah, it's the scattered bit. Never great for a Zoom session, um, but um, I'll be in touch with everyone. And if anyone has any questions about the conference, please feel free to write to me at any time. And thank you once again. Thank you, Matt. So there is the conference coming up, but before then we have one last uh, what session of, of these um, and it's in May and I've now forgotten the date again. Is it the 26th, Evan? Uh, yes, flicking through May, my, May, yeah, May the 26th, uh, again at uh, two o'clock UK time. And that one is gonna be on bookshops in China um, and a look at how um, uh, bookshops are kind of developing at the moment, uh, again, uh, from what I understand from the speaker, uh, sort of uh, having a bit of a renaissance at the moment. So that's going to be our last session for this academic year. Then we've got the conference. And Eben is looking at me as if he wants to say anything. So Eben, mm -hmm. no? I, I... <laughs> you're just being supportive, being supportive. <laughs> but uh, it is my usual call out for anyone else uh, Kristen thank you so so much for um, volunteering or kind of being volunteered a bit to do today's but it was it just is such a lovely space to just come along and talk about bookshops in all their various forms with people so mm -hmm. it'd be it really great if uh, yes yeah, somebody else could volunteer maybe for the first one of next academic year maybe sort of late September, October time, that'd be fantastic. Just get in touch with Evan and yeah. me. Or if you don't want to do it yourself, you may be able to suggest someone who should contact yes. to do a good job. Is something interesting you'd like to hear more? Yeah. And that could be a, you know, it could be an actual bookseller. Um, yeah. we've, we've got a few people in hand that we could approach, but it's always nice to open it to the group because you will have more suggestions. But I think that's all I had to say, Evan, unless you've that's got anything it. else. Apart from, have a good weekend. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank Enjoy you your so weekend. Thanks, Kristen. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Take Bye. care. Mind how you See go. You Bye. Cool. Thank you guys again. This was a blast. It's always Thank fun. You, Kristen. It was great. You really did a. <laughs> it was great talking. <laughs> like you said, we could keep talking until.